The rotten heart of the conspiracy truther movement is a rejection of the responsibilities that normally come with living in a modern civilization. I'm talking about things like paying bills, paying for gas or electricity, the essential utilities that keep us comfortable in our homes. They often claim that these things should be free or they don't need to pay for some bizarre and obstruse reason. What about paying taxes, paying for your local authority to collect refuse or build the roads that we drive our cars on? Likewise, they believe that these charges should not apply to them. It's a strange and bizarre conspiracy theory that is being promoted by a few deluded and delusional bonkers grifters. And when I think of bonkers grifters, perhaps the, the name that comes to mind most often is that of Richard Vobes. He calls himself the Bold Explorer, and until recently he had a channel with 200,000 subscribers on YouTube, and he would use that channel, or I should say abuse that channel, to regularly host all kinds of unsavory conspiracy wackaloons. And this is the channel that we're going to be exploring uh, a great deal for the next few weeks because it is a, an absolute smorgasbord of lies, dishonest nonsense, and plain old grifting. Today's lesson in Vobesology begins with an excerpt from a recent show. And like with many of Vobes's missives, it begins with an appeal to nostalgia. Do you know what these are? This is old money. When I say old money, I mean imperial money. I mean pound, shillings and pence. But some of the old money that I used to grow up with when I was a kid. And then in the early 70s, decimalisation came. It's one pound, 87 one pence, please. And we have what we now have, that sort of pounds and 20 pence pieces and five pence pieces and, and all the modern money here in, uh, in England. Right from the start of this farrago of twaddle, we can tell that Richard Vobes clearly believes that there was something good, if not better, about the old money system. He's referring to the pre-decimalisation system that was around up until the early 1970s in the United Kingdom. And we were the last country to abandon this ridiculous way of dividing up our currency units. There wasn't just pounds and pence, there were pounds, shillings and pence. And I'm not going to explain how any of this worked because for the purpose of today's show, it really doesn't matter. But if you Google or YouTube search for pre-decimalization old money currency, you will find many of completely pointless explainer videos. And I, I strongly recommend that. But Let's see if we can figure out why Richard Vobes is steering us down the old nostalgia river. The decimal ones that we have in our pockets, they are uh, um, produced by the Mint, by the Treasury, by the government. But these, these are from the Bank of England. And now most people think, well, that's obviously part of the Treasury, isn't it? The Bank of England. And, and a lot of people don't realise that the Bank of England is not really a bank and it's not anything to do with England. This is a spectacular farrago of twaddle and nonsense uttered by a man who doesn't really know much about banking or the financial system, but has never allowed his complete ignorance of a topic to ever hold him back from uttering and opining about it on YouTube. Let's start with some basic things he got wrong. Uh, the Bank of England is not a division of the Treasury. They are wholly independent from each other. The Bank of England is indeed a bank, and it is also the central bank of the United Kingdom. And uh, a central bank is a kind of bank. I, I think Richard perhaps is confused. It's not a retail bank. You couldn't go to the Bank of England and open up a current account and deposit your earnings from making nonsensical videos on YouTube if you still were monetized, which of course Richard is not. But if you were a major bank and you wanted to do interbank settlement within the United Kingdom, then the Bank of England would be your go-to agency for sorting that out. That's their function. That is what a, a central bank does, amongst many other things. So is the Bank of England a bank? Y yes, the clue is in the name, Richard Vobes. But let's listen on for a few minutes to discover what Richard Vobes thinks the Bank of England really is. It's a, it's a business, it's a corporation, and these are promissory notes. And does it not say in very tiny letters, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds. But the question is five pounds of what? 
five pounds of what, he asks, in a sort of rhetorical flourish, vaguely reminiscent of those YouTube viral listicles. Um, ten questions that monetarists can't answer. Well, on this occasion, it is a fairly easy to answer question, because it's five pounds of currency. The object in Richard's hand, that little rectangle of polymer with all the security devices, that is a token of currency in physical form, and it's been established by law. So you're, you're getting five pounds of currency when you receive that piece of paper. Uh, but Richard doesn't seem to get that. Uh, his mind is still somewhere in the 1950s or 60s, and he hasn't quite twigged what these things really mean. Five pounds of sterling silver now would be worth roughly about £2,300, something like that. If you wanted to make some money, real money, as in silver money, something that has intrinsic value, you could go to your bank, take in one of these and say, excuse me, I would like the uh, equivalent of this note, please, uh, in sterling silver because it does say on here, I promise to pay the bearer the, on demand the sum of. Oh, Richard, that is not going to happen. Um, firstly, because we left a, a metallic standard for British currency a long, long time ago, but, but also because uh, you're not going to buy five pounds or 2.2 kilograms of sterling silver for five pounds of British currency. That is just not the price of silver anymore. And were you to propose that particular transaction, Richard, uh, you would be laughed out of the institution, and maybe later accosted by some friendly police officers who would transport you to a local mental health facility. And there they would perhaps uh, perform a basic assessment on your sanity. And having done so, they might elect to uh, keep you as a guest of said facility until uh, a course of treatment was complete. And then, only then, uh, you might be let out, hopefully cured of your delusions. But that, of course, is not going to happen to Richard, because there's nobody to tell him that he's wrong, other than me, of course, and he's not listening to this show. Uh, he instead has a, a gaggle of toadies and sycophants who tell him that absolutely everything he's saying, including this utter nonsense, is correct. So having built upon these rather shaky foundations of ignorance and misunderstanding, let's now observe the, the edifice that he constructs himself, a, a tower of stupidity. Wait a minute. If it's just a piece of paper with words on it, then what is it actually worth? Well, it's not worth anything, is it? If Richard actually believed that, I I'm sure he would quite happily give away his five pound note. He would simply cast them all to the wind because, as he's just said, he, he believes them to be worthless. Of course, that is not what Richard believes. In fact, I suspect that almost nothing that he says is what he believes. Richard is an influencer, and he's there to push the buttons of his gullible, nitwit audience. And, and this is precisely the kind of twaddle that they want to hear. They are tuning in to his show to be lied to. It's probably only worth a, a fraction of a pence in terms of the paper or the polymer that it's made of. I mean, it does have all these special things on it that an independent, uh, sorry, a, a, a unique number, and it's got printing of the, the old Queen's face, and then on the back, Winston Churchill. And This might seem like a very poor quality stand-up comedy routine, an observational routine about the uh, security devices on a British five-pound note. But it's actually something a little bit more sinister. Richard is softening up his audience. He's laying the foundations for a more sinister argument that he, he wants to make. But in order to do so, you have to convince the audience that the value of a five-pound note is not five pounds of British currency, but zero. If you can make the audience accept this obviously false claim, then you can make them believe some even stranger things. And actually, it, it's purely by blind faith that we can take this into a, a supermarket, not that I recommend going to supermarkets these days, but or a corner shop or a, or a small family-run business, which would be much better. It's not really blind faith, though, is it? It's also lived experience, because we've all done what he says 
shouldn't be done. We've all gone into a, a supermarket or even a small family-run business, perhaps also a farm shop, the kind that Richard would one day see himself as the, the proprietor of. And we've gone into such institutions and we have paid for whatever it is we wanted with cash. So we all have lived experience that cash can be converted for goods in shops. Why is Richard trying to convince us that that's impossible or, or, or simply a, a, an act of faith that might or might not happen? It, it's almost like somebody arguing that the sun might not rise in the morning tomorrow. Absent of some kind of cataclysm, we know it's going to happen. That's just the way the world works. There's a system that exists. And you know what? It might be big and complicated. It might have big words. It might require people to study, to become experts at. But it's there, whether you have your eyes open or not, Richard. But all we've done is we've given them a promissory note. Well, if this is a promissory note that's no longer backed up by silver or gold or anything, because we're no longer on the gold standard and it's just blind faith, then why couldn't we get a piece of paper and write our own promissory notes. I could be the Bank of Vobes, couldn't I? Well, I suppose Richard could do what he just said. He could take a piece of paper and write, I promise to pay the bearer on demand a sum of a certain amount of money by a particular date. And what he would have there is a promissory note. And that's a real thing in British contract law. It's just a promise to pay a certain amount of money to the bearer in the future. In fact, this is called a negotiable instrument. It, it's a kind of contract, and that is enforceable. It's also, in this particular case, entirely pointless, because I don't think anybody would accept payment from a man like Richard Vobes. If you want to go to, to that corner shop, or maybe even the supermarket that Richard issues, uh, they would much rather have payment via some kind of debit card, or, or even cash if they have the facilities. But, but Richard thinks that his signature on that piece of paper has some kind of magical power. And then as long as I've got a signature, because that is the thing, that is the key, it's got to have the signature. And you'll notice this will have somewhere on here, the chief cashier has signed this, which makes it suddenly worth something. Mm. And so that's the signature, as I understand it, on the promissory note that we could make to pay our bills or to purchase things if the other person will accept it. Yes, if they will accept it. And I think that's the big problem in Richard's argument here, because why would anybody accept a promissory note from somebody like Richard Vobes, somebody who presumably is only trying to pay for something with a promissory note because he doesn't have any other means of paying for something? because his YouTube channel has been demonetized, his primary source of income for promoting ridiculous conspiracy grifts has been taken from him, he doesn't have any money. And now that he's feeling the pinch, he's not able to sustain him and the, the lovely Julia's lifestyle to the extent that he used to. And this is his fantasy, that he should maybe get free stuff that he shouldn't have to pay for things like normal people do. It's a bizarre, irresponsible fantasy that is backed by a very selective misreading, a sort of cherry-picking of British law. After all, they ought to accept it because didn't Lord Denning say in a f that promissory notes must be treated as cash? Richard Vobes has this 100% wrong. He thinks that Lord Denning's ruling in this case implies that all businesses are forced to accept promissory notes as a form of payment. But, but what Lord Denning actually meant by that ruling was that if you accept a promissory note as payment, then you must treat it as cash. In other words, you can't quibble this payment once you have agreed to accept it. So you have to be very, very careful whom you agree to accept a promissory note as payment from. Uh, what he's basically saying is that you have to do your diligence. You can't accept a promise as a form of payment and then go back upon it. So what that means is that businesses are even less likely to accept promissory notes as forms of payment because you're only going to accept that kind of promise from 
a business or a, a counterparty that you know and trust very well. And unfortunately, somebody like Richard Vobes, well, his behavior and his pattern of deceitful lying is going to send a very strong signal to anybody that he might seek to pay in this way. And that message is, don't trust Richard Vobes. So although that is one issued by the Bank of England, what's to stop us writing our own promissory notes when we have those tedious bills that come in and just say, hey, hold on a second, um, I may not have enough of these, but I do have a pen, I can sign my name, and um, I can write, I promise to pay the bearer the sum of on demand. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows if it's possible to get out of paying for goods and services that you have already consumed by issuing an empty promise, a promise to deliver money in the future, money that you do not have, will not have, and actually have no intention of paying. Uh, we actually have a word for that. It's fraud. Uh, did you guess, by the way, did you guess this is where it was all going to end up? That it was all about Richard's desire not to pay for things, not to pay for the, the, the services, the food, the, the utilities that he has already consumed. In fact, this should not be a surprise because this is the heart of the Conspiracy Truther movement. It is all precisely this desire to evade responsibility. That's all it's ever been. And if we listen to what Richard has to say next, he's hammering the message home. He's leaving us with absolutely no ambiguity that everything that he has always talked about is simply this one grift, this desire to just get free stuff. I know that so many places these days are saying, oh, we don't take cash, it's just uh, online payments or bank payments or whatever, but we don't take cash. I understand that if they're a registered company, you know, so in other words, they're a limited company, they're registered on company's house, they are obliged to take cash. Richard never cites his sources, so we'll never know how he came to understand that a business is obliged to accept cash payment, because that simply isn't true. In the UK, a business is free to set its own terms of payment. Uh, you can advertise that you take cash only or no cash at all. And anyone who comes in and, and willingly transacts with that business is under an implicit contract to pay in the manner that they have agreed to pay. Uh, this again is a symptom of Richard's belief that the rules don't apply to him, that he thinks he could go into a, a coffee shop, one where they, they have clearly specified how they want to be paid if you choose to consume their product. He believes he can consume their product, but then disregard the conditions that apply. It's wrong, but it's also incredibly impolite because Richard is saying he doesn't care about everybody else's convenience. He just wants to do what's right for him. He is so lacking in any kind of empathy that he just thinks he's entitled to get his way all the time. And to hell with the consequences for anybody else. You know, that business, maybe they don't have a cash register. Maybe there are very good reasons why they want to put all their money through a, a digital-based system. Perhaps it makes their accounting easier. Perhaps it reduces the amount of theft. Richard doesn't care because he understands something, probably from talking to Gary Waterman or, or Mark Steele or, or one of these other idiots in the conspiracy truther movement because that's his source of understanding. He spends all his life watching conspiracy videos on YouTube uh, because he doesn't have a TV apparently. That's where he gets his information from. Ah, oh, Richard. They are obliged to take it, even though they say, well, it's not our policy. And you can turn around to them and say, oh, well, actually, mate, you may not have a till, you may not have a cash register, but you are obliged to take it if you're registered on company's house and you're a limited company because they are still legal tender and you have to do it. That is not the definition of legal tender. Legal tender just means it's a form of payment that you can use to settle a debt. Now, that doesn't apply in this case, because if you go into a shop and willingly engage in a transaction with them, 
then you're obliged to pay in whatever way you agreed to pay. It isn't the same thing as a, a debt that you have just involuntarily found yourself in. But um, th this is going to, to end in another Richard Vobes humdinger. It's going to end in another argument why Richard Vobes shouldn't have to pay for stuff. And if they, if they refuse, I understand that if, you, if they refuse, it means they've refused to take legal tender. It means the debt for, let's say it was a cup of coffee and you're trying to pay for it, or a little meal, maybe a sandwich or something, and they said, well, we can't take that. We, we refuse your cash. Then there is no debt. The irony is so palpable because Richard likes to present himself as the defender of small business, the, the mum and pop coffee shop that he might use in preference to, to Costa or, or Starbucks, who quite frankly are happy to take cash. But it might be a, a smaller institution that doesn't want the cost and the risk of operating a, a cash register. And so Richard would quite happily go into this small business and despite the, the signs to the contrary, he would demand to pay cash and then believe that the, the coffee shop's refusal to accept cash entitles him to free stuff. This has all been about Richard wanting stuff for free. He's a freeloader and so are all of his fans. The, the people who follow Richard Vobes, who watched that video and, and think that he's telling the truth, th th think that he has revealed a formula for, for not having to pay for the things that everybody else pays for. And the sad fact is that we will all end up paying for this because when people like Richard Vobes fans misbehave, try to get out of paying, they make life more expensive for everybody else because they consume time in our court systems. They, they consume the attention of our public defenders. They make everything so much worse. This is why Richard is such an aggravating, such a, a, a truly awful individual. But what comes next is, I think, for me, the reason why I find him so perfectly, so horrendously triggering. Now, I may be wrong in all of this, I often am. It's only an opinion, you understand. It's just an opinion, isn't it? Richard could be right or he might be wrong. Do your own research. It's a disclaimer he likes to give at the end of all of his monologues. He doesn't want responsibility for the things that he has just spent 20 minutes saying. In fact, Richard doesn't really want responsibility for anything. He doesn't want to have to pay for stuff. He doesn't want to have to pay the taxes we all pay. He doesn't want to do any of the hard work that it takes to live in society. And that is the heart of the Conspiracy Truther movement. That's all it's ever been about. It's grown-ups who want to behave like children. And amongst those man-babies, there is nobody who is more dishonest, more irresponsible than Richard Vobes. Oh, Richard, you absolutely make my blood boil. And there will be more completely nutty, flurfy, awful people on the next episode of Mind of Steel in one week's time. And I can assure you, there's a very high possibility that it might be Richard Vobes again. But that's just my opinion. Do your own research.